Imagine I give you two identical bottles, both containing a clear liquid. The only difference is one is labeled Parmesan, the other vomit. Which one would you smell? I know what I pick. But here's the catch. Both bottles contain the same liquid, something called isovaleric acid. This experiment was done by psychologist Rachel Hertz in 2001. Participants in her study were convinced these two bottles smell different. Same exact liquid, different smells, same molecules, different perceptions. Now it might be tempting to say, well, that just shows you can't believe everything you smell because our sense of smell is notoriously fickle and easily swayed by all sorts of contextual influences. It doesn't seem to provide objective access to the world. But I believe the opposite is true. Throughout history, smell has acquired a poor reputation. It's been called brutish and unsophisticated. The German philosopher Immanuel Kant even called it dispensable and the most ungrateful sense in the 18th century. This negative belief persisted throughout the ages. I believe smell offers a valuable case to challenge philosophical intuitions about how we think the mind maneuvers through the world. Your nose handles a highly promiscuous stimulus. The same molecules can come from a variety of stuff. Isovaleric acid can be found in Parmesan and vomit. So what's the real smell of isovaleric acid then? Vomity or cheesy? And if you smell one and I smell the other, well, whose perception is right? This question is deceptive because it obscures what perception is about. Better to ask, what makes your experience of the world real when our experience of it so often differs? What makes our experience real is not what, but how we perceive. When we inhale, our nose picks up airborne compounds of a vast variety. These compounds travel up the nasal cavity to a cell layer called the epithelium, which contains the sensory neurons leading directly into the brain. Fun fact, these are the only nerves reaching outside your body. That's why they regenerate every three to four weeks. If they didn't, after just a few cold, or as millions around the world infected with COVID-19 have discovered, you'd lose the ability to smell. Now these neurons contain the receptors that physically interact with these chemical compounds. That interaction sends a signal to the brain saying, Can you smell that? So smell is like a fingerprint of the materials you're dealing with. It's an intimate sense where the molecules you encounter directly touch and tango with the receptors in your nose. That's unlike vision or hearing, where your sense organs don't pick up materials themselves but process them from a distance, as surface reflections of light or pressure waves of air. But your smell experience is not just direct, it is almost boundless. Smell is the only, the only sense for which we can artificially create entirely new stimuli. Fragrance chemists can create novel molecules with new odors, odors that have never existed on Earth and need not smell like anything known in nature. Unlike painters who are bound to existing colors, perfumers play with an unlimited palette. And while that may seem impressive, it also poses a challenge, a big data challenge. The amount of information your nose conveys is nothing to sneeze at. Odor chemistry is extremely complex. The chemical basis of smell allows for an explosion of possibilities for detecting all different kinds of odors. Your nose has 400 different receptors that can interact with 1 trillion odor molecules, each containing 5,000 different parameters in different combinations. So if you count all different combinations, all possible combinations of receptors and chemical features with one chemical hypothetically activating 100 receptors, the total is greater than the number of atoms in the universe. When it comes to your nose, the universe isn't even big enough. Besides, we seldom smell single molecules. We smell hundreds of them. Coffee, for instance, contains 800 different compounds. That's humongous data for your brain to process. If you were aware of every odor, all the time, everywhere, 
you'd be begging for a lobotomy. Instead, your nose hits the mute button and only alerts the brain when it notices a change in the environment. It spotlights the thing it needs to focus on. That's why you don't notice your home and only recognize its unique smell when you come home after, say, a holiday. Now, how does the brain know what that signal means? For that answer, let's turn to hearing. If we look into your brain, into a specific part of the auditory cortex, we know whether you're experiencing a high or low pitch tone by how the brain lights up. This idea of an input-output map has been central to advances in 20th century neuroscience. Smell offers a provocative challenge to that mapping paradigm. How would you spatially arrange odors in the brain? Do you put jasmine over here and mint over there? Do you arrange that type of molecule next to that type of molecule? No such map can be found. Instead, your olfactory cortex looks like a random mosaic. This wide distribution allows odor signals to be instantly accessible to various other brain areas involved in other cognitive functions. These functions can complement or compete with each other. And since attention is a limited resource, your brain must negotiate which signals to select, combine, or ignore. Instead of mapping the input, your brain measures its signals. It measures how the incoming signals from the nose are associated with other signals the brain is processing. And maybe this has happened to you. You're walking on a crowded street. The roar of rush hour traffic hits your ears. Food vendors all around. Hot dogs on your right, kebab on your left. People jostle to work, bumping into you. And then someone passes you wearing that scent. That special fragrance of your former lover. At that moment, this memory overpowers everything else. This phenomenon links to the essence of smell. Because in that moment, you're smelling exactly the same molecules from your former lover's perfume, and it happens like that. But not every smell is etched into memory. Often it requires a cue to trigger an image or association. And here, the brain can spotlight different bits in this mosaic of the olfactory cortex. Your brain creates flexible olfactory images from context and previous experience. Because smell is not just chemistry. That's like saying poetry is just words. Smell is about how biology perceives chemistry. Biology tells us that perception is not static. It is highly interactive. Our reality originates from these dynamics of perceiving. If your brain has to continuously negotiate external and internal data, well, how do you know what that funky smell is? Like other mental faculties, smell is not beyond your control. Your nose contributes more to your conscious awareness than your brain gives it credit for. Let's do an experiment. Get yourself a jelly bean or a glass of wine. If you're brave, grab an onion, something with an intense flavor. I'll take the jelly bean. Now, pinch your nose. It sounds stupid, but bear with me. And chew the jelly bean. Hey, sweet, but not much else. Now release your nose, swallow, and breathe out gently. Suddenly, the fruity notes of the jelly bean hit you, ranging from strawberry to citrus. But your tongue can detect five primary tastes. Salty, sweet, sour, bitter, and umami, which you know is that meaty, savory taste. Your tongue doesn't have a strawberry or mint receptor. When you chew, the molecules released travel through the back of your throat to your nasal epithelium. This is flavor as an olfactory phenomenon. What we commonly call taste is actually smell. Besides, your nose is also more accurate than you think. When you see posh people in a restaurant sending back their wine because it smells corked, they detect a compound called trichloroanisole, or TCA. In fact, if I were to pour this little bottle of TCA into last year's global wine production, that wine would smell of nothing but TCA to you. Humans can detect TCA in the 10 to single parts per trillion. It's like having skunk 
overpowering the smell of everything else in your garden. Your nose is a precision instrument, even though you don't realize it, but it gets much better when you do. Your sense of smell is not just better than you think, it's better when you think. In fact, research shows that doing intense targeted training, smell experts refine their ability to identify and categorize more odors because their brains recognize more patterns and associations. This leads to thickening of parts of the olfactory cortex. In smell experts, that part of their brain is actually getting bigger. And it happens in as little as six weeks. Perception is fundamentally a skill of attention. Smell training provides your brain with a cognitive muscle to expand the reaches of your perception through attention. Because thinking and smelling go hand in hand, like other mental skills, music perception, language, mathematics, your perception of odors can be trained. It can be trained to detect the nuances of smells. And it can also be trained to regain the ability to smell after loss. In fact, we can help recuperate smell after illness. Now, the ability to discriminate odors is not only strengthened with attention, it also alters the way you perceive the world. By training our attention, we can cultivate our experience and connect that experience with others. When you remember that divine glass of wine, it's not that prominent cherry flavor you recall, it's when and where you had that wine, the occasion, the atmosphere, and especially the people you had it with. Just like sommeliers, every one of us is building a relational database of smell in the course of our lives. It's a database that connects current experience with our personal past. The smell of my father's garage, your former lover's fragrance, may not have exactly the same chemical compounds, but we immediately know what that reference signifies. It's a database that further grows with social interaction. When someone points out a smell we hadn't noticed before, it immediately expands your worldview, right? How could you not have smelled this before? Now that you know and better appreciate how smell works, it's clear that your perception hasn't been deceived, as you might have thought earlier. It's been enhanced through interaction and negotiation. Smell is relational, not relative. Paying closer attention to perception allows you to connect your experience with that of others. So I encourage you to actively train your nose. Pay attention to the subtle qualitative changes in your present experience. If we don't pay better attention to our senses, we really are losing out. We're losing out in terms of the richness of our own conscious experience, and we're also losing out in terms of how we perceive each other and our shared experience. That's what led to my borderline obsession with olfaction. I believe smell can tell us a lot more about how the mind works by showing how the brain negotiates external data with experience. It shows us the role of attention and learning in conscious perception. And it also tells us about how we can create a shared perspective on the world by building a relational database of our common experience. By sharing food and drink, we enable our minds to discover new qualities with each other. In collaboration, we grow a richer perspective on the world and a richer vocabulary of our own experience. That is why I think the philosopher Immanuel Kant is wrong. Smell is indispensable. I prefer essayist and scientist Lewis Thomas' conclusion that smell may not seem a profound enough problem to dominate all the life sciences, but it contains piece by piece all the mysteries. These mysteries amount to nothing less than an understanding of the big question. How your brain makes up its mind about yourself within the world. Thank you.